Literate Discussions with M. David Hornbuckle. Welcome to another episode of Literate Discussions. Today we're going to be talking to Jason Kessler about Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio. Hey, Jason. Hey, David. How's it going? Going all right. Going all right. All right, cool. So today we're talking about Winesburg, Ohio, and particularly two stories from that collection, mm -hmm. which are called Hands, and the other one's called Mother. Yeah. But I think that, you know, we should probably spend a couple of minutes just kind of talking about Winesburg, Ohio as a book itself. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, this book. Um, well, it's a book that takes place in this town called Winesburg, Ohio. So that's where the title comes from. Um, and so it, the book can be seen as a, a collection of short stories um, that work together in various formats. Right. Uh, like we would, we would call it these days, we would call it a novel in stories, right? Because there's kind of each story, you can take each story on its own, but you can also read the whole thing. And there's kind of an overarching story arc yeah. throughout the whole series of them. The book itself, if you're giving it a narrative arc, is about George and his sort of uh, coming of age and him making a decision. It's sort of hinted at in the mother story, um, him making the decision to leave town um, mm -hmm. and go to Chicago. And so it's kind of funny that the two uh, short stories that you get excerpted, he's sort of a minor character in Hands right. and Mother but he's more of a feature concern in the, the novel at large. Um, yeah. So these stories, they're, they're supposed to be, um, what was it? They're supposed to operate separately. So you can excerpt them and the mm -hmm. stories themselves will make sense. Um, but another critic also mentioned that they're supposed to also be interdependent. So yes, the stories can work separately, but really they need each other for that sort of greater understanding of what the right so book. i guess the idea is that if you if you read the whole book then each story takes on greater significance in, right. a, in relationship to the other stories mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and, and i know that anderson referred to either these characters or these stories as or maybe both as grotesques mm -hmm. he uses that that term grotesque um what does that term mean to you grotesque a lot of people use it just kind of as a synonym for gross, but that's not really what it means. Well, it's taking something that is, for me at least anyway, it's taking something that is basic or normal and taking that and pulling it out of proportion. So it's not like, you know, oh man, um, I don't know what these um, gory sort of horror films that are so popular these days where it's just a bunch of blood and guts, right? It's mm -hmm. taking something that is you know, average or every day, but because you put a certain sort of skew on it or, or, or come at it from a certain perspective. Right, a distortion, cool. right, yeah. Yeah, yeah distortion, uh-huh. That also is, again, sort of the approach that Anderson takes in writing the stories and putting them together is that, you know, you start out with Wing Biddlebaum's hands and the description of those hands, the nervousness, the shaking, um, and that's just something that's a tiny sort of piece of who that character is, but that piece becomes, a, you know, a symbol or an image of the whole. Um, I think that's called synecdoche when you take something, um, you know, uh, a minor detail, but that serves to represent the whole. Yep. And I think that is, to me, the 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 sense or the the employment of the grotesque in in the book. Let's talk about hands. Um, sure. What what stands out to you about this story? One of the interesting things about this story and, and the stories in the book is this understanding of identity mm -hmm. and place. And so um, the characters that you meet in the book, a lot of them come from elsewhere and they've come to Winesburg from somewhere else. And in some ways, Winesburg is it starts out as as a solace or an escape mm -hmm. for these characters, but then they become sort of confined by the place, the, the small town sort of nature of the place. Um, and this story definitely has that. Um, you know, the, the character Wing Biddlebaum 
he's that's not his real name you know right <laughs> um that yeah and his real name is adolf myers yeah uh-huh which right. is i mean <laughs> coming after we don't name we don't name people World adolf anymore yeah. no no <laughs> <laughs> but obviously this yeah. book was written before that did he give himself this name it seems wing is a name uh, a nickname that the kids have given him of the yeah town? i think it's, it was mentioned that like that the people of the town like the people that he works with when he works in like the the picking strawberries mm -hmm. gave him that nickname wing yeah. but the biddle bomb part i it does mention that he takes an assumed name when he goes to winesburg that he doesn't mm -hmm. use his his former name right but so i'm not and yes and he got biddle bomb it says uh there's a detail where it says that he got that from uh a product he saw in a general store during his while while he was traveling okay from pennsylvania to ohio right so he's so if we understand that you know wing biddlebaum that's not his name um in part he's traveling under an unassumed name but also the community has named him in some way um you start to get at this issue of identity and um obviously in the story there's a reason why he's you know traveling and living under an assumed name um the story itself isn't you know explicit about it but he's been um accused of touching i mean touching hands is an important feature of the story um right. but he's been accused of um inappropriate touching of right. school right. kids so he was a teacher mm -hmm. uh, in his other life and he um it, sort of word got out that he you know used his hands a bit too much and um, he got beat up by one of the parents and um, was, you know, essentially. And a lynch mob basically yeah, came after him, town. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. he was run out of town, yeah. And so again, even that, whether he has been doing anything, you know, inappropriate or even illegal, or whether it's just, you know, the townsfolk in Pennsylvania uh, and the kids are, are you know, um, just sort of felt, I don't know, a little nervous about it or anxious about mm -hmm. it. It's, it's complicated. It is complicated. And especially his response when he starts to notice when he's talking to George, mm -hmm. he starts to notice that his hands are kind of like getting away from him. Yeah. And you can tell that it makes him nervous. Mm -hmm. It makes you wonder what really happened in Pennsylvania. And it's not, you know, uh, laid out clearly for us. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. later in a different story that your students aren't reading. There's a character who um, at one point has an outburst and he says that he killed his wife. And that's a reason why he's now, you know, uh, sort of seeking, <laughs> seeking uh, escape, a uh, hideaway in Winesburg. Mm -hmm. And the narrator um, and then George is involved in that story too. The narrator and George are sort of skeptical that, you know, this guy would have done that and would have sort of proclaimed mm -hmm. it in the way that he does. Um, so that's a feature of not just this story, but the whole book is this sense of identity. Um, in some ways, the character's identities are shaped by the place, Winesburg, but in some ways the characters are able to, are agents in, you know, shaping their own identity um, in, yeah. in ways that are not always sort of the natural course of things, but are uh, sort of devious and, they're trying to hide something. And that, that ties us into the, the other story, the mother, um, which uh, is obviously is focused on George's mother, although there are several paragraphs in a row that focus on the father. Yeah. Almost, it almost focuses on them equally at times. But it begins and ends with the mother, and, and it has to do with how she sees herself, again, her identity, how she sees herself and how uh, that is similar to the way she sees the hotel that they own mm -hmm. and how she sees her son mm -hmm. and how she wants her son to see himself. Right. <clears throat> and it's, and <laughs> the way she wants her son to see himself is, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's complicated because she does, she doesn't want him to be like smart or intelligent or maybe too smart or too intelligent. And or or too want, successful, yeah. Right, yeah, or too <laughs> successful either. But she doesn't want him to be like her no, and just kind right. of fade into the, the brickwork, right? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, She's basically a part of the front, a piece of furniture now, the shabby thing that nobody wants, and she doesn't want him to end up like that. 
Right. But she also doesn't want him to be too smart or too successful. And I guess probably because she would feel like she would lose her connection with him. Right. If he, if he went, if he went too far in that, in that direction. Yeah. That's a good way to read it. I hadn't really thought about that. Um, You know, as a girl or as a a young woman, she had, you know, dreams of. um, She wanted to be an actress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. And really getting out of, of Linesburg, it's, you know, I mean, it's sad that the hotel where she stays is actually her um, her home as a girl. And it's been converted into a hotel um, by her husband, who is like, you know, this businessman who comes mm-hmm. into town. And she thinks that she's going to have this, you know, brief sort of love affair with him. But then it becomes this, you know, marriage and they have where they hate each other. Yeah, they hate yeah. each other. And yeah. she's going to stab him with a pair of scissors, yeah. which she doesn't actually do, at least not in this story. No, yeah. But she's thinking uh, about it. Oh, yeah. And she's <laughs> you know, obsessing about it. And so, again, in the story mm-hmm. of Mother, the, the repetitions are, are interesting and important. Um, even the sense of the, the story begins and ends at the same place. You, you mentioned that the story begins and ends with the mother and the father mm-hmm. is somewhere in the middle. Um, but the story begins with this or after this encounter that she's had with her son. And then it comes back to sort of seeing what, seeing that encounter and what led up to that encounter. Mm. Um, it's an interesting, it's a, you know, confusing, <laughs> it's a confusing piece um, because of that. Cause you don't really know exactly where in time, what is, you know, where you are in the present time. We understand that there's some flashbacks. Right. We learn about her, her background and her romance with Tom Willard, but, um, but that sense of repetition and that, you know, that, that time is this, you know, just this, it's all just a bunch of history repeating for these mm-hmm. characters in this, this town that they can't get out, that they're stuck. So uh, I, I, it would be remiss of me to not mention that uh, you are not only a, a short story writer and novelist, yeah, but also right. a songwriter. And yeah. that you've written, uh, and that you have written uh, a series of songs based on the stories in Winesburg, Ohio. That's right. When I read the book, I read the book when I was moving from high school to college, so in my late teens, and I had stumbled upon it because I had read, you know, uh, J.D. Salinger's Catcher in the Rye, and I'd read all his short stories, and I was looking for something, you know. So w- where do I go from there as a reader? And I had done a little bit of cursory research on, you know, who uh, sort of influenced J.D. Salinger and this idea of the, um, the Bildung's Roman and, and the coming of age. And I found Sherwood Anderson's Winesburg, Ohio as part of that. And so I read it. So I was struck with, with the book and I thought, even at that time, man, I would love to be able to write some songs based on this material. Um, but I wasn't, you know, at that age, uh, a good enough songwriter to do it. So I sort of put that in the back of my mind. And then when I went and got my MFA, um, I was ecstatic to find that the book was part of uh, this class that I took on American modernism. So um, I asked the professor, instead of me writing, you know, the basic boring analytical essay, can I turn, you know, a handful of these uh, stories into songs and then write sort of an expository essay that describes the process that I took in writing Mm -hmm. these songs. And she was like, yeah, that's great. Go for it. So I I wound up writing five songs. Then I, you know, I wrote the songs and I recorded them and I got them posted online. Yeah. I mean, the material, even when I was a late teenager, just really stuck with me. And uh, and I will uh, I'll post the links to those uh, to those songs for my students to to check out as well. Uh, so, thanks for zooming with me today. I think this okay. is a good good conversation. Awesome. Um, yeah. Thanks for inviting me back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we shouldn't do this a third time, or it all you know. I don't know. We might uh, your computer might malfunction or something. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Man. All right. I'll talk to you later, man. All right. See you, David. Right, bye. bye. Literate Discussions with M. David Hornbuckle.